Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nicklich and my guest today is Professor Alex Haslam. Alex is a professor of social and organizational psychology and Australian laureate fellow at the University of Queensland. His research focuses on the study of group and identity processes in organizational, social, and clinical contexts. Together with his colleagues, Alex has written and cited 15 books and published over 300 peer-reviewed articles on these topics. His most recent books are The New Psychology of Health, Unlocking the Social Cure, The New Psychology of Leadership, Identity, Influence, and Power, and Social Psychology, Revisiting the Classic Studies. Alex is a former chief editor of the European Journal of Social Psychology and currently associate editor of the Leadership Quarterly. In 2005, he won the European Association of Social Psychology Kurt Lewin Medal for Outstanding Scientific Contribution. In 2013, he won the International Leadership Association's Outstanding Leadership Book Award for the New Psychology of Leadership book. In 2016, he won the British Psychology Society President's Award for Distinguished Contributions to Psychological Knowledge. In 2017, he won the International Society for Political Psychology Stanford Prize for Distinguished Contributions to Political Psychology, and also the Australian Psychological Society's Workplace Excellence Award for Leadership Development. And finally, in 2018, he won the Australian Psychological Society's Award for Distinguished Contribution to Psychological Science. Alex is a member, an appointed member of the Order of Australia for significant service to higher education, particularly psychology through research and mentoring. And it goes without saying that today's conversation is extremely insightful in looking at leadership. I can say that Alex's perspective on this is not only research-based, but flips this whole topic on its head and was very insightful and enlightening and in actual fact uh, uh, exciting for me to learn about and I hope that you can also find a lot of interest in this because it really shows that we can all be leaders in the way that we contribute to a common goal within whether it's our organization politics that we hold or you know, more importantly our family and friends so hope you enjoy this episode Alex, a big thank you for coming onto the show today. I've been really looking forward to recording this episode with you. Thanks, Nash. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our chat too. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I know that the topic today will will we'll cover, you know, or, or at least focus on that identity leadership space and you know, its implications on social and organizational settings, and that includes that clinical space and even sports environments, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into, into uh, you know, studying this area. Yeah, so I'm uh, my training was as a social psychologist. Uh, I originally did my first degree at University of St Andrews in Scotland, and then I came out to do my uh, PhD in Australia, which I did with uh, John Turner, who was one of the sort of proponents uh, with Henri Tajfel of social identity theory. And then I worked with John, uh, I finished my PhD in 1991. I basically w- worked with him up to the time of uh, his death, which was really the, the next um, uh, 15 years. So all up, I worked with him for about 20 years. Um, he was really interested in social identity processes, um, but you know, laid the ground also 
for an analysis, uh, an incredibly influential analysis of social influence. Um, and then the work that we did together, but also work I've done with other colleagues, Steve Reich or Michael Plato, but other people here at University of Queensland, uh, in particular Nick Steffens, has really uh, taken that up and really examined leadership as an influence process and understanding the things which, if you like, make leadership stick in an array of uh, context and understanding the uh, complex dynamics between leaders and followers on which that process of mutual influence centers. Tell, tell me a little bit about why that's of interest to you. What what strikes you? I know that a lot of us have probably read books on leadership or have been yeah. interested in yeah. different leaders, like yeah. like to follow particular leaders yeah. rather than others. What's, what's yeah. brought you to Well, the, the, the kind of obvious point really is that leadership is everywhere and leadership, you know, fundamentally is, is critical to processes of social change. So if you're interested in doing things in the world and if you're interested in changing it, um, then leadership is a, is a is a really critical uh, topic. So you know, lead, change is always driven by leaders, but it's also always delivered by followers. So it's never just about leaders. It's always about the followers who are inspired, motivated, enthused by leaders. Um, and it's that again, as I say, it's that dynamic that's really fascinating. And I think what's interesting as psychologists is that um, we often think about leadership as just something that's maybe only relevant to something like organizational psychology. But if you, it's pretty, it's relevant to pretty much every major topic in social psychology. Um, it's relevant, obviously, to things like sports psychology and political psychology. But it's also uh, incredibly relevant to clinical psychology. And some of the research that we've done most recently is really understanding the role of the clinician as the role of a leader. And, and we don't um, often really think about that because we don't really like to focus on maybe issues of power and uh, authority. But actually, you know, clinicians do have power and they are more particularly if they're effective, they have influence and they inspire followership in the people who they are trying to help. So actually, um, we've argued, you know, something like the Therapeutic Alliance, which we know is absolutely critical for uh, the delivery of clinical outcomes. How, to understand the therapy, for a lot of clinicians, the Therapeutic Alliance is just a black box. Oh, it's, just, it's just full of all these unknown variables, things that seem to be sort of important, like whether you like your therapist or or you have a good relationship with them or blah, blah, blah. Very atheoretical, non-specific, not part of the therapeutic package, if you like, just just a, a, an incidental extra. But actually our work and a lot of the evidence we have shows, no, it's absolutely critical to the delivery of therapeutic outcomes, particularly in things like, well, in, in, in you know any therapeutic setting, but often in aid context, for example, if you think about aid workers who are delivering help, one of the reasons why aid is often incredibly ineffective is because people get the dynamics of leadership all wrong. They they come across as outsiders who are kind of doing leadership to you, not with you or for you. So um, uh, our work really argues, no, you've seriously got to rethink that and you need to bring this analysis to bear on your actual understanding of the therapeutic process. And, you know, I'm not a clinician. My wife is um, and we have a lot of and we work together on a lot of these things too with other colleagues particularly in Australia particularly Tegan Cruz and Michael Plato at uh, ANU um, and you know and the more you kind of run with that particular ball the more um, goals you score and what you see is again a failure to come to grips with those leadership dynamics actually create, leaves this whopping great hole at the heart of the therapeutic process. Would it be reasonable to, in, in some sense, consider the word leadership to to mean trust and to mean influence, that there is a working relationship where it's established on or grounded in a sense of 
uh, you know, belief from the client that they're with a competent therapist who trusts who they trust that has their best interests in mind, without necessarily the power dynamic. There, there, there's not one. Yeah, holding yeah. power over the other. It's still a a collaborative yeah. um, uh, work, but there is an expert in the room uh, yeah. who who can assist. Yeah, and I think well, all of those things are basically true. I think trust is absolutely critical for leadership, but I would argue that that's a product. It's a it's a correlate of the core leadership process. So it's an index of it. And yeah, where you have effective leadership, you have trust, you have authority, you have and you have influence, as you say, and really the the question you raise is really the critical one because actually you know you can't really have a a good discussion about leadership without starting by defining what leadership is and actually that's a again a, one of many sort of criticisms i have of lots of stuff in the leadership domain is people just imagine you know you just talk or write on about leadership without ever really properly defining it. so what is leadership well leadership is the process of influencing another person in a way or or group of people in a way that motivates them to contribute to the achievement of group goals so and there's lots of kind of elements of that definition that are really important but the critical most critical thing is that it's a process of influence and it's about motivating people to contribute to some collective outcome it's always about leaders if you like doing that influence but it's also implicitly also and and explicitly about followers who are influenced and therefore ultimately it's their followership whether they go along with what the leader recommends or suggests or argues for it's whether or not they do that is that is the proof of leadership so one of the papers that I have with Michael Plato is without followership there is no leadership so I can sit here, we can sit here for the next hour, and I can tell you how wonderful my CV is and all the fantastic things I've done and how capable I am. But if at the end of the day, people just switch off the podcast, well, there's nothing happened. There's nothing to see here. There's no leadership. So leadership is only going to occur if people go, oh, I heard that interesting podcast with this bloke. I don't know what he was talking about, but he made some good points about this. And then they go and talk to somebody else and say, well, no, I think you've got that wrong because I think you need to understand leadership as an influence process that centers on a group dynamic um, and it involves followership. So if so, again, it's not what I do ultimately that makes this leadership. It's what other people do and, and, the, and the impact that it has on the groups that we're a part of and then and then the groups that those groups impact on and the way those groups impact on uh the world so again one of the big problems i mean there's many there's myriad problems with the kind of leadership literature but but probably the mo the one that really plagues it is this idea that leadership is just about leaders and that to understand leadership we just need to look at the characteristics or the attributes the qualities the experiences the teaching the development of leaders if that's all you ever do you will never ever 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 understand leadership because it, it it's obviously much more nuanced than just looking at these indexes of trust or authority. Yeah. It and actually looks about, at what are the mechanisms. It's about, yeah, it's about this relationship between leads and followers. And it's about that influence process. So it's about it's about being influenced. The other thing there too to to um note is that you know is the relationship with power now the reason that leadership is a power process is not because leaders just have power and they just tell people what to do that's not what leadership is about it's about power through so leadership is about power in the world because if you do leadership right or if leadership is done right it mobilizes other people and then those people go out and do things in the world and then the leader has power because they're actually then changing the world through those followers so one there's lots of definitions of power too but if we're talking about power over we're not talking about leadership what when we're talking about leadership we're talking about power through and power through is if you like true social power which is the capacity to affect various forms of change and obviously that can be yeah, as we said, it can be in a therapeutic context, it can be an organizational context, it can be in a military context, it can be in a business context, it can be in a sporting context. You know, you just want to do, you know, you want to do something that l- leaves your group in a better position than it was when you started this process. Um, and to the extent that you do that, 
and are seen to do that and, and understood to do that by members of the group, then your leadership will be recognized and fated and celebrated. If you don't do that, it will count for nothing. So again, ultimately, and, and this is where we're going to go in this conversation, the, the kind of hallmarks of leadership are, are how it is perceived by group members. So, so again, a leader, if you like, is only as effective as their as their as the perceptions of their leadership from or on the part of followers or, or other members of their group. So if people in your team, you may think, I may think I'm just a fantastic leader, you know, nothing you can tell me about leadership. But if everybody in my team thinks I'm an idiot, um, and and they and they and they don't value what I do, not for myself, but for us, for the group, then my capacity to have a positive impact and positive influence on the group, on them, to do leadership will be chronically limited. I think we all know people like that who who have this idea of themselves as great leaders and they've got the CV to prove it, as it were. They go around telling everybody how wonderful they are. They leave everybody cold and they and they and they have no capacity to affect change. That's a very bad stance for a therapist. It's a very bad a stance for a team leader you know in all of those uh, kinds of contexts because ultimately it's the perceptions and then the actions of team members of group members of followers uh, or putative followers that is the proof of your leadership are there any regular occurring characteristics that tend to go with leadership because i'm thinking in my mind you know leaders can be vastly different in different settings and you know whether yeah, it's a absolutely. political one whether it's an organizational clinical yeah. and so on yeah. are there anything from you know the research and obviously your broad knowledge yeah. that that shows yeah. up as being you know reoccurring that comes up yeah and and of that question obviously comes up is a one that's asked sort of perennially in the leadership literature and 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 actually the the clue and the, the key to answering it is to really think carefully about the question and and how you interpret that, you know, depends on whether you're going to find the answers. And historically, traditionally, leadership researchers, particularly in sort of organizational fields, have imagined that you're just looking for a basket of traits or attributes or characteristics and then the and the issue is well what are those so and and really that was that was something that was defined leadership sort of scholarship since the time of plato so if you read plato you know he talked about quickness of mind or courage or um intelligence uh, you know that over time got distilled by other people who talked about creativity maybe different types of intelligence emotional intelligence um dynamic intelligence all sorts of things of that nature the problem with those um th that approach to kind of come up with the checklist or the shopping list there's two real problems is one is you find um effective leaders who have um really diametrically opposed sets of characteristics for, for argument's sake there's not very much that donald trump has uh, as a, as a set of characteristics other than maybe confidence that, that appears on a standard list of sort of organizational leadership characteristics the issue is that um whatever you whatever dimension you take again so you take probably the, the attribute that's discussed most in literature intelligence if you look at intelligence it correlates or you know formal intelligence as sort of measured by psychology it correlates about 0.19 or something of that nature with uh leadership effectiveness quite a quite a small uh correlation and also immensely variable so there's some context in which leaders are more effective if they're actually really stupid okay but and this is the critical point the what does matter is not whether you have these attributes but whether you're perceived by people in your group to have attributes which are relevant and good for us intelligence is one of those things that often groups value not always but then what predicts leadership is not whether or not you are whether i am intelligent whether you are intelligent whether your listeners are intelligent it's whether they're perceived to be intelligent by the people in their group 
Now, I mentioned Donald Trump a minute ago. You could argue how intelligent he is. I mean, you know, he thinks he's very intelligent and other people think he's not so intelligent. Let's not go there. But let's just note that Democrats think Donald Trump is very stupid and Republicans think he's very intelligent. So, and what matters for Trump's leadership is the perception of his leadership. So the correlation between perceived intelligence and leadership is more like about 0.6, point, you know, 0.65 or something of that nature. So being understood to have characteristics that matter for leadership is more important than, than as it were, just having them in the abstract. And then, of course, the question is, what's the correlation between uh, leap between intelligence and perceived intelligence or courage and perceived courage or whatever it might be well have a guess it's close to zero okay so so again and and i think we all know people who are have you know the, all these qualities in spades but they're not effective as leaders because those qualities aren't valued by the people in their team or they don't they don't manifest in ways that are perceived to be useful or valuable by uh, people in their team. So again, followers' perception, which in itself is an aspect of followership, is absolutely critical here. Um, and yes, you need to, as a leader, ask yourself, what is it that matters for my followers? What are the things they're looking for? Okay, that's number one. Is So when it comes to the qualities, is um, not what, what makes a leader in the abstract, is no, what is it that my group is looking for and then the issue is are you perceived to be doing those things that the group kind of wants you to do and that values and valorizes and if the answer to those things is yes um then you're much more likely to be an effective leader but that is not broadly speaking where the leadership literature has been or has, has sort of come from but in recent years i think there's greater recognition of these things particularly in academic psychologists not i would argue in and uh, not i would and uh, not just argue i would point out in in sort of popular discourse as leadership i mean that continues very much in this kind of shopping basket checklist uh frame of mind to you know very much to its own detriment but that's also related to the fact that often when people are commenting on leadership they're not actually interested in providing a formal analysis of leadership they're just interested in either eulogizing about some leader who they happen to like or trashing some leader who they don't and 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 those are you know that's journalism that's not science sure it makes a lot of sense because this this understanding or at least the perspective of looking at you know how do followers perceive their leader what are the attributes and the question there is actually do they possess the attributes that are good for us as the group and so if yeah. i think about some someone like um you know, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, I know that I heard others talking around when the, you know, elections were on about that he had good ac uh, economic acumen because he was a businessman. And so that for some people appealed to them saying that will be good for our country. And so, you know, there is influence through at least the perceived you know, acumen that he brings to that position. And I, I think I've heard that for every prime minister, whether, whether it's, you know, they are, you know, strong leaders on education or they're going to look at mental health in a, you know, in a priority way or, you know, that we're going to do more with this leader in, you know, moving our country to be greener through, through you know, particular policies and the likes. So it's, it's interesting uh, and I think much more nuanced and functional to look at it that way, which says, is the leader perceived by their group? Whether they hold those um, characteristics and that is another question, but uh, so long as they are believed to be good for the job, which is actually good for the followers, good for the, the cause, then people are willing to contribute in line with that, with, with that yeah, and you know, them vote, vote them. in that example. And yeah, and the critical point there is answer to those questions change. So if you look at the, any leader and the trajectory of their leadership, it you know at the at their high point, you know when they're elected or when they start out, people go, oh yeah, this person's really good for us, or they're going to be really good for us. And then the low point is when people say, actually no, you know what, they're rubbish for us. I mean, Scott Morrison would be someone who, 
you know, had a had, you know, some moments in the sun, but pretty much every leader that's true of, you know, sure. think about football manager, Jurgen Klopp or whatever it is. Yeah, when they are getting results for us, you know, the front pages are full of or back pages if you're talking about sport, they're full of stories about what a great leader they are. And then, but then once the results fall away or people start to have doubts about, you know, who they're going to into bat for, um, then all of a sudden their, their leadership sort of effectiveness evaporates. So, um, and, and, and what kills it is when uh, leaders are no longer perceived to be doing it for us, they're either doing it for some other us, i.e. them, or they're doing it for themselves. So again, a leader who is seen only to be in it for themselves, this is a this is that's a very toxic, um, you know, uh, prescription. But also, of course, part of what we often talk a lot about what makes leadership, but the world is also, uh, you know, a big part of the world is also the process of leadership destabilization. So in politics, it's not just that politicians make a case for their own leadership. They also want to undermine the case for their opponent's leadership. And actually, people do that all the time in lots of contexts, organizational and otherwise, sporting and so on. And how do you do that? How do you undermine other people's leadership? You persuade their potential followers that they're not in it for us. They're in it for themselves or they're actually their agents for some other collective, you know, whatever that might be, their church or or some other political party or some other set of interests. Malcolm's home will be a case in point. You know, yeah, people say, oh yeah, he's a really good economist, but he's not really a true conservative. You know, he's not, he's he's a he's a he's a he's a small L liberal who's actually really a closet socialist or something of that nature. And if you can persuade people that, you know, ultimately this person is not one of us, not doing it for us. Then, yet, yeah, then they're going to find it very difficult to uh, do the leadership they want to do, and just to then pick up on that, right, and and to come back a bit to your earlier question around, like, what is it? What are the characteristics or qualities that leadership have? Our own research, when we're talking about this process, this influence process, as centering on a, a, a sense of shared group membership. We argue that that process is one of shared social identity, so that leaders perceive themselves as part of a group and followers perceive themselves and the leader as part of that same group. So the process is one that centers on a sense of shared identity. And we argue that all leadership, it actually, that's a critical underlying dynamic. And in those terms, and really our research over the last mm, two year, 20 years, has really focused on unpicking this. But really, there seem to be kind of four dimensions to that, two of which I've already alluded to. One is that leaders ultimately need to be seen as one of us. They need to be seen as someone who's who's of us and kind of for us in that sense, which, you know, that's obviously true in politics. You know, no Labour Party member is ever going to vote for, a, 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 you know, a Conservative. And similarly, no conservative is ever going to really vote for a Labour leader. I mean, their, they, their identity may change and they may change their vote, but it's so long as they define themselves as a conservative and they define the other person as one of them, it's going to be really difficult to vote for them. In order to overcome that, you have to see yourself in terms of different identities as an Australian or as a New Zealander. If you think about someone like Jacinda Ardern, how she managed to persuade conservatives to vote for her when she did, that was because not because they saw her as a Labour leader, but they saw her as a good leader of us, New Zealand. So you've got to be one of us. You've also got to do it for us. So as I said, you've got to be someone who is palpably delivering outcomes and results for us. The third thing, and so those two things are like what actually technically refer to as identity prototypicality. That's the so you're a prototype of what it means to be one of us. The other is um identity advancement, doing it for us. The two others are firstly identity entrepreneurship. So what effective leaders do is cultivate and create a shared sense of us. So they're in the the, the their key currency is that sense of usness. And they look to build up uh, our sense of ourselves as part of a group of which they are representative. So leaders don't just like say, oh yeah, I'm one of us or you know i'm i'm a good conservative and leave it at that no they they persuade us of their uh that they are indeed of the group but then they also work hard to 
bring members of that group together to cohere around a sense of shared identity. And then the fourth thing, the final thing, is something we refer to as identity impresarioship, which is that leaders organize activities, rituals, events, proceedings of various forms that bring groups together and allow them to live out their shared identity, festivals or whatever it may be, or rallies or or or, 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 or even just courses. You know, in a way, this podcast is a is a kind of an act of identity impresarioship. You're putting something out there to try to bring people to create a tent that people might, um, you know, uh, organize themselves within. And to the extent they do that, and they say, oh, look, there's really interesting conversations going on in this space, or this is a really interesting group of people here, then you're going to have influence as a leader. You're going to say, oh, you know, I really... Nash's uh, podcast, that's a really good one. And and I get, or I and we get a lot out of it. And I'm going to say to other people, I think you need to go there because there's really interesting conversations being had there. So again, as a leader, you're not just talking the talk of us, you're, you're walking the walk and you're putting energy and effort into doing things that make us real. You know, you're doing a podcast, you're doing a blog, you're attending rallies, you're organizing you know, meetings or get together or celebrations, you know, and, and, and. Okay. So there's a psychological sort of, uh, and, and, and a sort of narrative side to identity leadership, but there's also a behavioral and a material side to it too. And at the end of the day, you know, that the power of it is about those things aligning. So it's never just about like being seen to be a good leader or talking the talk. It's actually about then changing the world and creating the material conditions which allow your group to progress and if you do that then that's the optimal set of conditions for your leadership to be recognized by others and and, and celebrated itself but if you don't if you can't deliver those group group outcomes psychological and material ultimately yeah your you, you know your leadership will be uh will, will go cold and 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 not be uh, recognized won't won't you know, will never be labeled as such. You'd just be a journey person, as it were. It's really fascinating hearing about those last components because it it seems to me like that's the stickiest part of, of the space, the glue, which kind of says, you know, when the yeah. identity as, 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 as a group, that entrepreneurship yeah. of saying, you know, we are collectively yeah. important or we are different yeah. to others or we are special in some way or whatever yeah. it might be well, that's, um, yeah, and that's also like, yeah that's right. I mean, making the group feel special is really yeah. cool. having a distinctive positive identity that's a that's another that's a really i think important term and it's i mean the critical point there is as a leader you've got to be ready and willing to do the work there and and again and one reason why leadership fails is because either leaders get bored or tired of doing that work or they think no they think that leadership is like riding a bike they think no i know how to do that i was a really good leader 10 years ago and everybody knows that i don't need to do any work anymore nah the minute you stop working for the group then you know then you just you'll just be, you'll again there may be some skerricks or you know uh residual impact and there may be you know a bit of but actually your real ability to actually uh, make uh, the kinds of change you want to achieve will be will be sort of limited. But but again, you know, I, the put bit I stress in my class, I guess, there is that look, you know, leadership. You're always going to have to do a lot more than go on a course on leadership and find out what it is and say, yeah, that's it, and then check whether or not you've got those things. This is something you're going to have to work at with your group. You're going to have to find out what your group thinks leadership is, what it wants, what it needs. And then you're going to have to work with them to deliver those things. And you're going to have to continue to do that for so long as you want to have influence and an impact. And that's, you know, that's, but that's hard. And that's why people sometimes say, look, you know, Jacinda Ardern just the other day saying, look, I, you know, there's no more petrol in the tank. You know, I've given it everything I can. And, you know, and that's kind of fine in a way. Um, well, you know, but, but, and that, and, and presumably, she will have a certain amount of influence from the sidelines, but she won't have the same sort of influence that she had when she was at the center of this group driving, you know, real, uh, you know, policy advancement or whatever it might be, or getting people behind her, uh, you know, uh, strategy for tackling the pandemic or whatever it might be. It's interesting because I've never thought of it in in, in that way that it, it requires you know, an ongoing investment that almost feels like it's a, um, 
a growth uh, position yeah, I mean, it might yeah. not be because there yeah. can be an established group and you know everyone thinks that the leaders you know maintains yeah. that position yeah. and it's yeah. not necessarily growing but it almost feels yeah. like to lead is 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 at least at the very beginning very intensive in in, in its growth phase of trying to influence more and more people yeah, so three points I'd just say there. One is you're absolutely not alone. So when you say, I haven't thought about it like that, most people don't, and and that's not how the literature thinks about it, which is why the leadership literature is a bit of a mess, frankly. Um, or there's a lot of it that doesn't do much work, and there's a lot of hot air. That's number one. Number two is, yeah, it requires this this huge amount of, of sort of energy and the idea of leadership as a doing thing. But the critical point there is, that is not just like personal energy. Ultimately, it's collective energy. So it's about, you know, I can't, I, however much I, I'm, I'm interested in being a leader, I can't just sit in my study or my office and just and do it and then and expect to change the world. No, ultimately, I, I have to work with other people to develop that collective enthusiasm, that collective uh, kind of intensity. And the third point I'd say is, Lee, I mean, again, obviously, you know, this is what my life's work, I suppose. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm quite, I'm quite accustomed to that reaction. And sometimes people go, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And they go, but, but that can't be true. That, that, that can't be surely true. And I'm and so hang on, let's just pause here. And there's people listening and say, think, tell me, and put it on a postcard, and tell me an example of leadership, i.e. influence, that doesn't involve the things that we're talking about. Show me a case of leadership that doesn't center on those four things I, I talked about. So there's the, the, the um, where we're going to go and the 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 point that I, I really want to kind of tie these things together with is one is that leadership is everywhere. So leadership is central to everything that we care about, whether it's your family. You, again, we don't ever when we're talking about your family and how your family works, we don't think about organizing your summer holiday as leadership or um or getting you know cooking or getting the kids off to school or whatever it might be. But that's leadership because it's influencing people in a way that motivates them to contribute to group goals. So leadership's everywhere. And then second, so if you accept that, okay, it's everywhere. It is. Secondly, all leadership is identity leadership, okay? All leadership is about these processes of mobilizing the group and moving it forward and being seen to do that. Um, and again, that's if, if, you, if you put those two things together, what we're talking about is something that really, really matters. And yet, as you said, people don't rarely, if ever, think about it in, in those terms. And, um, and, and, they, and they don't, if you like, when they're tackling this in the domain of, activity that is of interest to them whether that's as a therapist or as a business person or as you know running their family that, that they're not uh looking at it through uh this uh lens and that i'd argue is why or you know implicitly because we have faulty models of leadership that's why we end up with such rubbish leaders because we you know we we buy into uh very problematic understandings of what good leadership looks like <laughs> It's fascinating even just thinking about it from my family context and thinking about how both my wife and I can be leaders at the same time, but we yep. we have a little you know playful uh, conversation that we talk about portfolios. And so you know I might be the leader of a particular portfolio, i.e. the outside, the garden, you know yeah. the, the mechanical things about getting cars serviced and so on. Yeah. And her portfolio might be around, you know, the kids' social events yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, you know, looking after them and so on. We've got different portfolios, but it's it's interesting because we still uh, work together and collaborate and we ask questions yeah. of each other, but there is one that tends to take the reins. So it's fascinating that yeah. even in a two-person uh, uh, you know, relationship, we are still leaders and we swap uh, yeah. leadership depending on Absolutely. what the portfolio yeah. or topic is. So. So that's a, there's a couple of again, a couple of you know, I mean, one of the things I like about leadership is there's all these different threads you can once you start talking about it, you say, oh, that's right. But one is we said at the beginning, leadership is a process by by one or more people influence a group in a way that mobilizes them to contribute to achievement of group goals. It's one or more members of a group. It isn't leadership is not just done by people who have the title of leader. That's another big mistake. No, mm -hmm. and just having the title of leader doesn't make you a, lead, a, a leader, or doesn't mean that you're doing leadership. So again, leadership can be done by 
everybody. And actually, if you look at effective groups and teams, what you see is it's precisely that, or families for that matter. Everybody does leadership. You think about Christmas, you know, you know, I, you know, and probably over the course of your life, you go to lots of people's houses for Christmas and you see different families from the inside. The ones that are most functional, are the ones where everybody contributes and everybody, they they have a shared understanding of us and what we're about and what we're trying to achieve there. And everybody, it's, to use a term that's used in the domain of sports psychology, a really effective team is a leader full team, but it's also a follower full team. So people don't quit the, you know, Again, they don't, they don't, they're not hung up on who is the leader. I mean, some families, those things are really dysfunctional. You know, no, 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 only father can cut the meat or whatever it is. Well, okay, if he's so wonderful, get on with it. Well, that doesn't, those things don't lend themselves necessarily to good outcomes. No, you want everybody buying into the leadership process, but also willing to put their shoulder to the wheel in the interests of the collective, but also being able to and interested in reading the group and understanding what it needs. So when there's like an emerge, we do a lot of research in another thing in high reliability organizations, which are things like hospitals or mines or aircraft carriers, the thing that is, an, or emergency services, things like that. The, the thing that's the hallmark of really effective high reliability organizations is that all members of the, the delivery team, whatever the team is, have internalized a sense of collective mind, a collective understanding of what the group is, and are, are, are interested and motivated to do the bit of leadership that they need to do to help the group as a whole move forward. So they're leaderful groups with a really strong sense of shared social identity that's practiced and internalized over a long period of time and that leaders work really hard to embed and enact you know on a on a sort of daily basis and but those things are always fragile you know all of those groups you can you know you can restructure them or you can you can damage them by um undermining that sense of shared identity in ways that will take really highly functional groups and make them very dysfunctional by the same token you can take dysfunctional groups and if you have someone who's on the or you have a group of people who are on the ball and understand the importance of the types of things that we're talking about now well then you can have something akin to transformational leadership where you know you 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 kind of repair the group but critically it, it involves leaders being focused on the group, not on themselves as individuals. And that's, again, is that's where, for example, a lot of MBA training and crap leadership courses go horribly wrong. And there's plenty of them. And 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 I should add, too, plenty of money to be made out of them. Look, it, fl it really flips this whole conversation on its head because the, even the word, you know, leadership almost feels like it's the pointy end. It's the person at the top when, when in actual fact – the followers are the leaders, you know, where, when the current, you know, the water current is going, if, if all of it's going in one direction, it's very powerful. And so every contributing member is a leader in their own rights. You know, yes, yep. there may be specific people who are, you know, uh, uh, quite focused on the influence part, but it needs, it it requires all the followers. The followers, you know, are a part of that that current. So it's fascinating to hear that because it really changes the game. It, it yeah. says that everyone I'm, is a leader and and has, you know, in, at least in their own right, the capacity to influence. And my point is not that they have the capacity, they do influence. Yeah. You know? That's right. I mean, but but sometimes that 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 their ability to do those things is not capitalized on or mobilized and, yes. and again i think we've all been in groups where this dynamic that we're talking about just doesn't exist because someone they, because it's either been stamped on in particular ways or or indeed you've got a kind of toxic leader who's only interested in their own voice um that you know then all of a sudden the wheels can come off but you're right i think in really effective groups it's really hard to see the seams you can't you know if in if you think the sort of the tennis ball of leadership and followership the two bits they're sort of welded together and you can't really see the seam and it's not really it's not really clear who is doing the leadership and who is doing the followership there's a great uh, quote from the politician Ledru Ryan which says you know i am their leader i must follow them so that really the most effective leaders are actually the people who are most committed to doing high quality followership you know because they are 
wanting to read, understand, and move the group uh, forward. But 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 only so long as they have that motivation and they're driving into that, and they have some skill around that. Only so far as they will they be doing effective leadership. So just kind of wanting to do that in the abstract isn't isn't enough. And that that that's why it becomes so complicated in places like you know politics and organisations where you know in one setting or group you can go out and say you know this person's for the people or for this organization and in another setting which might be among those executives do they have the executives uh, uh you know trust and and you know belief and the like and sometimes there are you know particularly in politics things that you and i are not privy to that are really important that that um you know they, they, these high level conversations and leaders understand but you know, we don't become privy to, and then we feel like, well, they're not working for me. They're actually working for, you know, another country or whatever it is. Is the typical thing, and, and often, you know, again, in politics, you're often trying to persuade. If you're trying to undermine the other group, you're trying to persuade people that, you know, I mean, if, you know, that they're just in it for themselves, or they're lying in their own pockets, or they're, or you know, or, or they're off in some esoteric space that has no bearing on the rest of us so that's that's absolutely right i mean the critical point there is all effective politicians and all effective leaders in pretty much every domain again families again play a, a really good team game i, I think well, again another kind of recent example i think of this is say anthony albanese a lot of people going into the, and again this is just part of the, the journalism i suppose but is they're going oh you know i don't think he's a really very good leader because he doesn't he doesn't conform to some sort of stereotype of like what attributes a leader should have he's a bit seems a bit of a sort of non-entity or he doesn't seem very uh you know uh, charismatic or whatever it might be um and then, and then you see, well, actually, no, but the real thing is he can organize a team of people around him and they can work collectively to move things forward. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, yeah, maybe, but he's leaving. He is actually quite an effective leader. And it's kind of like, oh, what's going on there then? Um, and, you know, and I think Scott Morrison always talked a good game as a, as a, as it were, leader. But again, it was because that didn't translate into things that matter or mattered or were perceived to matter for us or Australians or whatever. That it was to the extent that that was the case, and that obviously changed over the course of his time as as uh, prime minister. Um, then, then so do his stocks as a leader. Um, and again, if I mean, again, in our work, and this is again the work in particular led by my colleague Nick Stephens, but that what we find is. You know, actually, you can take pretty much everything that's out there in terms of measures of leadership. Well, you, you really can take everything. I mean, you can put them all in a horse race. And we've done these studies. Now we've done research with uh, uh, collaborators all around the world in something like 30 countries, um, uh, hundreds, uh, sorry, thousands of of organizations and so on. And in every single context, every single context, whether we're talking business or sport, whatever, the the thing that's most predictive of someone's leadership is not those abstract shopping lists it's whether they are perceived to be doing it for us they're perceived to be one of us they're perceived to create a sense of us and they're making us matter and if the answer to those things is yes then broadly speaking you'll find that leaders are doing leadership i.e influencing the group members and when it's not they're not um and and that's why I guess in our own research and some of the practical stuff we do, we we say, well, if you really are interested in knowing whether the leadership is going on here, this is what you need to do. And the other bit I'd throw in there is a little kind of irony is that often people aren't interested in leadership for all sorts of different reasons. They are, for example, just interested in getting a job where they get paid a lot of money. So, you know, if I'm a CEO of an Australian company, there's quite a bit of evidence that that things that lead to, and, and again, this is a project that Nick and I and other colleagues have been working on, that if as a leader of an organization, you're seen very distant, and one, one thing that contributes to that is extremely high pay, and that creates a distance between you and your followers, well, that actually tends to be bad for your organization. So the fact that Alan Joyce, whatever he gets paid, I, I, I forget because it's a, you know, we're talking many, many, many millions of dollars a year. Forget the number. Um, uh, you know, uh, to the extent that's the case and, and uh, that he feels distant to his 
employees, other people who are working for Qantas, that doesn't lend itself to a, a, a being a high reliability, a high functioning organization. And again, I think, you know, and, and you come, you started off by talking about trust. So there are things that you can do as a leader that can undermine that sense of connection to your followers. One is pay yourself a lot. One is sack people when you hit hard times. One is make them feel like shit. Um, and, 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 okay. And to the extent that CEOs do that, and many of them do, well, actually, that's a recipe for uh, dysfunction. And, and one thing that comes out, again, very clearly in the literature is there's a very, very small and in many cases negative correlation between how much you pay leaders and how effective they are in doing leadership. Wow, this is a uh, this is a real refreshing take on 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 looking at this and and exciting to tell the truth. It really, you know, while you're talking, I'm uh, you know look looking at my life and you know the people that influence me and you know the, yeah. the responsibilities that I hold. So let's and just talk about. I, I often them. say that to yeah, I say to my students often. Okay, don't, tell, just let, okay, they come into my master's class and they. And they have this idea about leadership and they're thinking about business leaders and say, right, okay, so let's take this definition of leadership. And now tell me where you had in your life have experienced really good leadership. Where have you actually felt mobilized and motivated by somebody? And probably in eight out of 10 students, the answer is, well, there's, sorry, there's, there's two really common answers. One is, you know, my mum or dad, my parents, you know, were really, they really, helped me and they really motivated me and you know created a path for me or some family member and then the other is is, is a teacher someone at school someone at school who like but who worked for us and believed you know believed in me and you know and helped me to to find a, a a group as it were i mean if i think about myself i think about so i had a really strong relationship with those teachers but what they did was navigate me towards groups where we could work together and in that group context i was kind of energized and and motivated and of course that's i think what most parents are trying to achieve in their families they're trying to they're trying to bring the whole family together and move it forward you know uh, so that in due course their children are able to take on those responsibilities as or, and the and the mantle of leadership if you like and to and to have a role in in steering the group forward when they're no longer motivated or able to do it so yeah absolutely and and, and again I, I i think what you said i think leadership is just i mean I, I i think it's 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 absolutely fascinating really exciting uh field it's 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 exciting partly because of actually how it works it's also kind of fun because you as someone who you know this is my you know this is what i live and breathe you see how spectacularly wrong people get it and watching that is kind of fun in its own sort of car crash kind of way um but it but it but it but again it it's at a societal level you know the thing that kind of, one of the things i think that was really you know one of the silver linings to particularly the early phase of the pandemic was I think as a community we got to we got to grips with some of these more communal aspects of leadership and we got away from the sort of great man model of leadership. I mean, but there's the the horse with great man written on the back of it will always be running hard in this race because there's a lot of there's a lot riding on it, a lot of material self-interest. And there's lots of, you know, there's lots of pernicious influences in the world which would have you believe that that's all that matters. And more particularly, there's a great paper by some people called Gemmell and Oakley called Leadership, an Alienating Social Myth. And the idea there is, you know, and this goes back to Plato, the idea only a certain number, you know, percentage, small, very small proportion of people have got it in them, have got what it takes to be a leader. That's that sort of way of thinking is a way of excluding people from the leadership debate, the, the, the kind of process but it's also a way of justifying, again, why it is that only men or an elite group of people have been to private school or are well-connected financially, why they're the only people who should be getting these roles and responsibilities. But when you look at the pandemic, you see, no, the people who were delivering the outcomes were often, you know, they were unheralded, unsung people who just got on with the job of doing what we needed them to do. So, um, uh, but again, in the world at large, the, there's a lot of interest in maintaining a faulty, dysfunctional 
uh, view of leadership because it justifies having certain people there and it excludes other people from thinking that this is something that they should have a part in. And I think so it's a, a profoundly anti-democratic view. And I think ultimately leadership is the ultimate democratizing process um, uh, because and democracy, when it works effectively, is precisely something which is tuned into the needs of groups. And of course, that's what fundamentally leadership is. Alex, where can our listeners find out more, you know, in terms of, you know, books and papers that, you know, resonate in, in what you've discussed? Because obviously I, I can go in, yeah. I can go online, I can go into a yeah. shop and I'm going to find effectively yeah. books that say, here are your traits, you know, here are yeah, the, 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 yeah, the yeah, five yeah. best things to have yeah. as a leader. But where can yeah. we find this more refreshing point of view that you're yeah. talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, firstly, if you, I mean, we have, the, the, I think, you know, we've published a huge amount of research on those things. And if, and if you just search for a lot of that online, you should be able to find it. But if you need anything specifically, drop me an email. That's no problem. You should be able to find me without too much difficulty. But also, yeah, our book here, um, The New Psychology of Leadership, this was uh, the first edition of this was uh, published in 2012, the second edition, uh, 2020. Um, um, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's a reasonably kind of accessible, uh, or we hope it is, uh, sort of journey into these kinds of issues. It's a an, an pretty comprehensive treatment of a range of things we talked about today, but there's actually a lot more to it, as you can probably uh, guess but but most importantly i think it has a lot of the sort of hard evidence and and some of the really interesting sort of stories i think around these things when you actually make this concrete by talking about um you know history and 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 why certain things worked and why other things uh didn't so i think you know i i think one of the things i think as a psychologist is that we often like we 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 like to be in like compartments. I'm an organizational psychologist or a social psychologist or a clinical psychologist. And I, and I think that's problematic enough. But I think actually, you know, as psychologists, we don't engage enough with other things like history and politics and other things, which actually Great. need to inform our kind of scholarship and understanding. I'm particularly, and, and my colleagues are really, I'm, you know, particularly interested in in history, I guess, and 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 looking forensically and archivally at like um like um you know how these things uh play out i'll just give you one example of one study that that sort of speaks to these points and again i think it's just a really simple point it's one that i pretty much always use when i talk about these things this was a study nick and i did uh, about eight years ago now i think and we were just looking at australian elections and we we're looking at who wins australian elections and we looked at the official election speeches of the two main candidates in 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 what were at the time 43 elections going back to federation in 1901 and in those elections 34 of them were won by the leader who used collective pronouns we us and our the most so talking to and for us is absolutely critical to leadership and if you don't do that you won't ultimately be supported as a leader we have other research shows that you can put a, a concrete value on a collective pronoun in a company report. And the value of a, a collective pronoun in a company report, this was in Germany a few years ago, was about 800,000 euros. So again, talking to and for us is something that is the currency of leadership and followership. And if you're not talking that language, you won't be having the impact that you uh, kind of want and need to have I mean, that's just one example of i mean of some of the sort of quirky research i think that we've done around those things but and i have to say too i really enjoy i you know as you probably sense i always enjoy uh talking about these things i'm really keen you know to for this conversation to to get some purchase i have to say you know i'm close to retirement now and 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 and, and every time you know i do something like this it's it's almost like doing it for the first time because there's no sense in which this is is part of the figure. It's always part of the background. Obviously, it would be great if in my lifetime there was some sense that that might change. But you know that's a matter of hope, not uh, hard data. And Alex, certainly your passion come comes out immensely and. Uh, I know that when people become passionate, they become, you know, even more youthful. You can see the excitement and, you know, the the uh, glimmer in people's eyes and and that certainly oozes out of this conversation. And, and to tell you the truth, it is 
it's extremely refreshing because it, you know, even that small little example that he gave in terms of language, I don't think that human beings are clever enough to go out and be able to disguise language of, you know, we and our and, you know, together uh, in in just a, you know, single um, speech that has to be part of their narrative. So it gives me great hope that, you know, true leaders do that all the time. It's part of their, their, their nature. And so that's what we're attracted to. And, and, and thank you as well for, for your book, uh, you know, the new psychology of leadership and it's identity influence and power and power. And again, um, that's the power through not the power over variety. You know, uh, so, uh, but we talk about that. Yeah. So again, you know, we're talking about power and the capacity to affect change. And again, that's what ultimately draws people to uh, leadership, but not in that traditional sense. But yeah, Nesh, no, I really enjoyed it, the chat. I, uh, hopefully uh, the listeners have stuck with it and found it reasonably um, engaging. And hopefully too, it's kind of, again, motivated uh, them to go on and read a bit more and do a bit more and, and think about what this means for the domains of activity in which they want to see uh, positive uh, forms of change so ultimately yeah the power of this will not be about just sitting down and me guffing on it's about actually people getting out there and and making a difference so thank you very much look alex the the beauty of this conversation is that we can have an extended conversation so those people who are curious you know who who are open-minded to hear from the expertise of yourself um and you know other guests are you know in that way already you know, primed and willing to be influenced, but you know, thankfully it's influenced by data. You know, influenced by science, and and obviously someone who's who's passionate and doesn't care what what it what the actual outcome is. It's what the data tells us and how life is. So once again, Alex, big thank you for for your expertise and your time today. It's been it's been appreciated, and I you know, appreciate you. Thank you. No, it's been a great conversation. Thanks very much, Nesh, and uh, yeah, and good luck to all your listeners. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.